Welcome to A Tale of Two Scribes. I'm your host, Eric P. Bishop. This is a podcast where interesting people come and tell about the stories they've crafted. As for myself, I'm an author. I've created novels, short stories, novellas, and even poetry. If you'd like to find out more about what I've done, please go to my website, ericpbishop.com. Thanks, and enjoy the journey. Welcome back to another episode of A Tale of Two Scribes. Tonight, I am pleased to have James Razone on the program. And for those of you who don't know James, James is a accomplished author, a veteran, and he's a small business owner who's doing quite well for himself. So welcome to the program, James. Great to be with you guys here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. So um, first thing I want to dive into is something we've talked about off the air before, but um, I want to talk about what got you into writing and what you mm-hmm. actually write, because um, your background is quite fascinating. But can you mind talking a little bit about your journey through PTSD and how that brought you to become a accomplished writer? Sure. So I've shared this on a few different podcasts and in a lot of my uh, forums and comments and stuff. I I got into writing basically as PTSD therapy. Okay. So Mm -hmm. when, when I was uh, training and gearing up to go to, go to Iraq um, at the time, I so I initially started in the Army side, went to basic training in 90, January 97, Fort Leonard Wood, and then uh, was doing that for six years. Then I flipped over to the Air Force a couple of years later, hmm. and I was uh, uh, gearing up to go to Iraq as an interrogator. And so we were going to be in, embedded in a joint unit and go do that mm-hmm. action pack stuff for a while. I wanted to write a journal of my experiences because both my grandparents, uh, you know, they had fought in the war in World mm-hmm. War II. And they encouraged me as I was getting ready to go to Iraq to keep a journal and okay. you know, document that, what you feel, what you're seeing, what's going on, mm-hmm. all this stuff like that. Because they say, when you look back on it later on, that, that's going to be helpful for you. Um, and, you know, it, it has been. But, you know, when you're working, you're 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 so you're so intense with your job and what you're doing you don't have time to process this kind of stuff you mm-hmm. don't have time to like figure out what's going on you're just action 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 and for me it, the ptsd really started hammering me and hit me hard um when i lost uh what probably lost my first job was was hit me in like 2014 mm-hmm. and then again 2015 and again 2017 and I had time where I was able to kind of think about what we've been involved in, what we've been doing. It's mm-hmm. coming up on 10 years from having, you know, left theater. Um, it started to really hit. And at the time, it was so funny because I was talking with the VA uh, about this. And the gal there is like, well, you know, why? we were doing this cognitive processing therapy. God awful thing that they make you do, right? So you write out the incident over and over and over again. They mm-hmm. try to get it all out, desensitize, whatever worst thing you could possibly do so uh i was like i can't do this until so she's like all right well i want you then to just write a book hmm. and i was like what would i write because she's thinking she's sending me down a rabbit hole to hmm. just have me writing something for ever cathartic basically you know, yeah. yeah cathartic like that and so she said why don't you write a book about the kind of stories and and, and scenarios and things you want to read but nobody's writing Mm-hmm. And because again, she's thinking this is going to draw me in. It's going to keep me doing that activity, focusing on that, and maybe help help me deal with that better. And again, it's all about keeping your mindset in a better place and not down that dark path where mm-hmm. a bullet seems to be the answer. Um, right. And so I started pursuing that, and I started writing the kinds of stories I wanted mm-hmm. to read that nobody was writing. Put them up for Am- on Amazon. And in 2015, our first our first uh, month, we made I think it was 81 dollars. It's like wow, a handful of people actually bought this thing. Wow, You're a paid author at that point. It was, you know, <laughs> and it started to boost up a little bit more. You know, and it started getting to be like a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the second book came out, and that one started to do a little better. Next thing you know, you're like, wow, we got two books out. We're hitting, you know, a grand and a half, two grand a month, and starting to think hey this could actually be something mm-hmm. and at the time i got another job working in, in chicago and so i'm you know vp over at aon insurance doing their cyber risk assessment stuff and okay you know i've got an hour and 50 minute one-way commute into the city my nine hours, 
uh, hour Ooh. and 10 minutes back on the metro, back out to the, out to the suburbs, and then home. And wow. that's rough. You know, so it's yeah. four hours of commuting, basically. I would read so much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when that job went away, that's when I kind of sat down and said, you know what? If I'm willing to spend four hours commuting a day, nine hours slaving for the, for another company doing this, mm -hmm. what could I accomplish and do if I was to put all of that focus and time and energy into writing mm -hmm. just full time yeah. and I'll apply for jobs and, and, and maybe I'll get hired again. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. instead of wallowing in my misery or being upset or wherever else, right. I'm going to dive into this writing full time, really gear this out. And see what I can make of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of when things really took off. I, uh, it was what, I think it was the spring of 2017 at that time. And uh, I was like, all right, well, if I'm gonna write a new series, new war series, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And was just kind of looking at it and saying, all right, what are the most likely uh, scenarios from 2017 to 2030? Is really was the window I was looking at. Okay. And um, basing off a lot of the former experiences in places I've worked before. I kind of was uh, looking and saying, okay, it's going to be Ukraine, Korea, Taiwan, Pacific. That's going mm -hmm. to be the eight, the hot spots for uh, yeah. the next 15 years. Um, and then it was like, okay, who's going to be the players? And it's going to be China and it's going to be Russia. And so I came up with this red storm idea of how mm -hmm. these two nations would somehow find themselves embraced together in a, in a competition against, you know, the, the West. Yeah. And uh, that's when we came up with that scenario. So then we had Battlefield Ukraine, published that in like August of 17. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went down the rest of the chain of six books. And those things took off. They just, lightning in a bottle, just absolutely took yeah. off. And that's what basically led us to writing full time. It make that decision. It just I'm not going to uh, pursue another job. I'm going to focus on doing this and, and make it work. So before we go into that next part, I did want to, and I don't want to interrupt you, Please the lady... Water. <laughs> the lady at the VA that kind of started this whole mad yeah. process, has she been mentioned in a book or acknowledged or anything or dedicated or anything like that to her? Uh, honestly, no. And okay. I feel bad about that because I kind of have forgotten. So I think this was in late 2014, okay. 2015, when she kind of told me about some of that. I was on a good headspace. Yeah, and, understood. You know, well, I was, it, <laughs> it's amazing that nugget of what starts people on the path and you, and, yeah. and it's never kind of the same thing. So ev everyone really has, that's the amazing thing about talking to other authors and getting their perspective on, on why they actually sat down and finally started a novel or why it was their fourth novel that got published, whatever, but cause it's always a different answer. And it's always, when you actually kind of look at it, it's quite fascinating what brings people to the place where a they think they can write a book, uh, yeah. b they think someone's going to want to read their madness and nonsense that's in their head. Um, because the hallmark of a good author is they do it and people want to read it, and that's it's fascinating yeah. how they got to that spot. And they keep coming back. That's the thing. Because yeah. I always tell a lot of new writers, look, anyone can sell one book. It's right, the first book you write, typically you can get that sold. The trick, however, is to get them to come back. Yep. And that, that's where the craft comes into play. That's where, you know, research and, and you know, the professionalism of what mm -hmm. it is you're trying to produce comes in. Like, I look back on some of our earlier books, particularly our first series, and I'm just like, oh, wow, I cringe, you know, I, I, yeah. I see that. But at the same time, that was the best I could possibly do in that right. moment with the knowledge and experience I had and the resources yeah. I had available. That was the best I could produce. Mm -hmm. and. Somehow, some way, it took it, it worked good enough to to allow me to continue it a little longer, and then the next series took off and right. it's been off the races ever since. Well, it resonated with people, and mm -hmm. whatever that magic was to start with, obviously, it's continued on. So, by the time this airs, my next book will probably already just be coming out, or right around there, about a, awesome. you know our lag time. And I'm I'm just at the point where the editor was supposed to final copy edit was supposed to come back tomorrow, but it will probably be a couple more days. Um, mm -hmm. But the last couple of days, I've been getting emails from the editor, and just knock my socks out praise like, man, right. this is good, or man, I, I this is such a cool concept of what. And I tell you what, that's 
Because that's the kind of person that I want to read it and be like, you got it. Because if I can get the editor hooked, mm -hmm. I know I can get readers hooked. And um, so, yeah, it's kind of been one of those every day I've got the emails. I've kind of been like, just hopefully that I said, hopefully that last email comes through and says, you still got it. <laughs> you ended it yeah. good because <laughs> you built me up for like disaster here. But no, it, yeah, it, it'll be good. <laughs> consumer votes and they, they the consumer ultimately determines as it, whether it's a success or failure, which sucks sometimes because yeah. uh you know they buy that they're gonna buy it or they don't they're gonna share with their buddies or they don't right. there's obviously lots of little nuances and tricks and things you learn along the way with the business side of how to how to engineer some of these things to happen naturally mm -hmm. um and when you when you get into like some of that research and studying the business craft of selling books you know because mm -hmm. this is a business uh, you start figuring out how to engineer the fan, the book is, you, that you're writing so it has that uh, ability to take off uh, organically and stuff. You know? Right. I mean, the big thing we do is um, when it comes time for like writing a new book or the next book in a series and I mm -hmm. look at this and I say, okay, I'm going to need a bunch of new characters. Mm -hmm. um, I put a call for characters in my reader group. I'll just say, hey, guys. Okay. I'm going to be writing uh, a couple new units or a couple new scenes here. I need some characters. If you want to have a character in the book, uh, you kind of you know put your name, your own self down, nominate a friend or whatever. Give me a little you know story about why this person you want this person. Uh, what's their rank, uh, job position? Uh, it depends on uh, what branch I'm writing for at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, which one they want to be in, and do you want your character to live or die a glorious death? <laughs> and so however they give me all that stuff, I find a way to weave all that into the yeah. books. And so they 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 love it though, because yeah. if this is what we should be doing as writers is engaging with the reader, the right. consumer, and finding out what is it that they enjoy reading the most and want. Mm -hmm. And then as the as the producer, the writers, we start to look at that and say, okay, this is what they really like. How can I create a story that can touch all these points? Yet still mm. convey what I'm trying to convey, what I want to talk about. Right. Like all I, my books have very specific themes and things that I'm wanting to talk about or or looking at or positioning yeah. and, and kind of guiding, so to speak. And you can see that in all the books. Sometimes people won't recognize that right away. But the moment I tell you what it is, it's like light bulb. They see yeah. it instantly. That's awesome. I love the names thing, too, because to me, the names... I do make up some names totally off the top of my head, just something I think flows or the character speaking to me. But um, for Breach of Trust, my next one coming out, I ended up doing about four different giveaways. So I had the epic mm. death giveaway um, of the the person. And I let them, I told them, I was like, I'm going to kill you like the most epic way ever. And it's, um, it's a veteran. Uh, uh, and, and she's super excited to get, she hasn't seen it yet. Um, actually, what I told her I was going to do was send her the book minus that chapter. Take mm. that part out so she could know ahead of time. And then I was going to send that chapter separate. And I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, we'll talk about interrogation a little bit, but I guess I have a cruel side of me because I said, you're going to read your chapter on the podcast. Oh. If it falls completely <laughs> flat and boy, this sucks, or she doesn't ball like I want her to. Oh, then, geez. You know, <laughs> we could always just not air that episode. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a delay in these things. But then she's totally willing to do this. Uh, Ama Dare, um, who a lot of people probably watching the podcast will know who she is. Um, but I've I've almost built, but backed myself into a corner because I built it up for so long of like, this is the most epic I, I can think of. And so now it has to live up to it. And I will say, I had a couple beta readers um, back in February, come back to me and they're like, wow, what you did with Ama's death made me cry or made, or, oh. or elicited this thing out of it. And I was like, at least I got them. If Ama ends up that tough Navy facade comes up and she just like, didn't do anything to me. And I'd be like, seriously, I couldn't do better. <laughs> but that side of it to me, from the writing perspective to be, and, and also to give people that, um, that connection to the book and it's not 
for me, it's not even just because I want them to go market the book for me. It's like, no, I know how cool it is to see my own name. It's happened a couple times in friends books. Um, Mm -hmm. Man, it's neat to see your name in a book. People resonate with that and and it means something. So again, not always, but a lot of times, like I even do family stuff or or people like childhood friends I grew up with, I'll, I'll drop those names in and not tell anybody that that name actually means something to me. And maybe that person that I hadn't talked to in 30 years might pick up my book and be like, hey, I'm in this book. Be like, oh, yeah, hey, I hadn't talked to you in 30 years. There you go. So, yeah, yeah, I love doing doing that. And then also doing the uh, the the units and stuff, too. So mm-hmm. a lot of times I'll ask the readers, you know, what unit were you in? Still an active unit. Yeah. And then we'll craft that unit with some of the people they knew from it awesome. at that time. And you put them in there and do that. And so uh, I, did, I did it a lot with the Monroe Doctrine series and then mm-hmm. with the sci-fi series. So we've spent several books on the sci-fi series where we had the uh, the 101st Airborne Division. So now they're the 101st Orbital Assault Division going, you know, going into the future. And so we did away with the brigades and went down to like regiments. And so we, okay. we had the different regiments like that and, you know, all the different, uh, you know, companies inside them. And, you mm-hmm. know, we followed, uh, you know, in one, one section we're following, you know, part of like, uh, you know, part of echo company and some of the different characters who are carrying on this, this legacy of this mm-hmm. unit that has such history dating back, you know, what our timelines like 2106 or something. So not that far in the future back right. you know, hundred some odd years to world war two and that's really neat or we have you know first infantry division with the bloody first and or uh you know the um third third id you know rock of the marne uh mm-hmm. and their history of world war one and now they're in you know this massive uh you know trench fight in another planet or something mm-hmm. um, it's just neat to be able to weave all of that history together yeah and uh, we with the commanders and, and some of the people that are talking or narrations going on inside the book, well, we I'm a real big World War II buff. I, I love a lot of the World War II history. Mm-hmm. And, and so I find a lot of ways to weave in uh, past historical battles or campaigns from either World War II, sometimes it's another like Korea mm-hmm. or Vietnam or maybe the Gulf War, and talk about the scenario or battle that we're currently doing in the book and how mm-hmm. it relates to that one and how this commander is leveraging a lesson learned from here to apply it in the current situation he finds himself in. Mm-hmm. Um, all those correlations and touch points, they're really neat because mm-hmm. it brings it into a lot of, it brings it forward in a really good focus for the reader as they're, as they're reading or listening to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps give a more explanation of the historical things that went on, which is really right. neat. Uh, it just, I don't know. I think it helps keep a lot of history alive and going mm-hmm. and really ties things together. Well, so that begs the question of how do you keep and, and what's your methodology for keeping everything straight and right. making sure you haven't used it. I used it in this, you know, this Monroe doctrine book, so I can't use it in this book or, or if I use it, it has to be, you know, correct or a reader's gonna yeah. send you so, a nasty email <laughs> that is a really good question and it is something that a lot of writers do struggle with uh i'm not going to say i'm really good with that my you know got it all figured out i don't mm-hmm. um what you tend to do or what you should do is establish uh what typically would be like a series bible yeah so going to be like your canon for your series and say okay mm-hmm. what are my characters i'm gonna use so typically Sometimes I'll reserve the right to name more of the main characters. Sometimes, sometimes a yep. lot of one or two special readers will get to do that. But mm-hmm. um, I have those. We outline that those pieces there, and then you really kind of create that Bible. What got talked about? In, in what in form a, does it take? Like, what? How do you keep track of it? Is it written, or is it like an Excel, like a spreadsheet type of thing, or a Word keep, document? Yeah. So for right now, I keep it all in a Word document. So okay. my my series Bible for the sci fi series is uh, gosh, was eighty seven pages, I think. Okay. Probably like thirty or forty thousand words. It's pretty big because that series is now ten books. You know, so yeah. it's got a lot of content and information inside of right. it. Right. Um, one of the things that's really helped though is I've kept a really good timeline. Okay. So every year I've got something happening. So I break a year down into thirds. So it's like early, mm. mid late whatever that year is and then i would put in you know a handful of bullet points of things that were either discussed in the book or that happened in the book during that time frame Mm -hmm. or things that were happening in the in the world 
yeah. during that time frame that was mentioned or or was going to be mentioned somewhere in the book. Okay. And by doing that and having that stretched across, say, 12 years or 20 years worth of your timeline like that, mm -hmm. it's a lot of data, but it's really good because it keeps you on track. Mm -hmm. It lets you go back and, and reference something in book nine to something that happened in book two or three with accuracy yeah. and draw a parallel back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really helpful when you can do that kind of stuff. Now, not everyone starts out doing that. And I did not start out doing that. Um, right. I've kind of, I've got myself in a little bit of a pickle sometimes where I, <laughs> you know, I've screwed a few things up uh, in, in the past. Um, generally speaking, I've, I've been kind of blessed with having a pretty good memory for recall for certain things. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible with remembering names sometimes, but I remember faces. <laughs> I remember places and I remember right. a lot of situations and some of those nuanced details. Um, and because of that, I, that's helped me with a lot of the writing. I also don't take a lot of traditional published writers. They're slow. I mean, not to knock or anything. This is my full-time job. Okay. Yeah. I, if I spend eight hours writing or six hours writing five mm -hmm. days a week, I'm going to produce a 500 page book, you know, probably in six weeks, seven right. weeks. It doesn't mean it's ready to be published. It's got to go to editing, Correct. but I don't stop when that thing's in editing. I'm working on the, the subsequent book, right? I'm working on the subsequent book. And at that point, my wife who co-writes with me, she handles, you know, she, she has her scenes and things that she inserts in to help mm -hmm. tie everything together. And then she's coordinating with our editor at that point. So when mm -hmm. the editor comes back with change requests and things like that, my wife's working on that with her, getting yeah. that. And if it needs to come to me for a structural change or this or that, or need a new chapter or got to explain it a little better, I'll fix some of those things. Mm -hmm. But I don't generally see the book until right before it goes published again. Because uh, gotcha. I've already one or two books ahead at that point. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. the beauty, I think, of doing it and, and running it as your own business run um, yeah, like that too. Yeah. Because if you were with a big publisher, I've had this conversation with, with someone else on, on a, a podcast recently, even um, you might get a second book a year, you know, out of that process. But most of the time, you know, you're, you're their may guy and they expect you to develop a historical fiction book every may. And that's, that's their bread and butter. They don't want you to come out with three, four books a year. Yeah. And so, but so for those authors that are blessed that they actually can make a living doing this, which is the the exception of the rule, but and they can make a comfortable living and they only come out with one book a year. Crazy, I, isn't it? You better have some good hobbies because what the heck are you doing for eight months out of the year? So I, I a lot have... of those people um, are usually working on, um, they're usually working on another book or series on the side. Uh, is kind of what they're doing. Um, so but like one of my friends, um, he's a tribe pub writer, um, Rick Campbell. He writes a lot of the uh, Trident Deception series, uh, mm -hmm. sub, sub books. Yeah, um, I've well, seen I'll, him online. Yeah, I'll ping him every now and then when I'm writing a sub scene or something for one of the books and say, hey, man, is this, okay. like, is this cogent? Is this going to work? Am I out, out too far in the field or something? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, this work great. Right. Just do this or change the verbiage for this. And so, you know, you collaborate with on technical scenes with certain writers who have those technical chops right but you know he is a prodigious writer you know he shared me he's like he's probably got three or four books that he'll write a year that they don't touch and they just kind of sit on the side uh okay. he's got a sci-fi entire sci-fi thing he's been developing working for years okay. i don't know when or if he's ever going to publish it but uh yeah. he's like i'll have like the next two books and try interception written and done they just don't want them yet and right. so that's when he works on something else. Something else. Okay. I've been trying to get him to like go private and just do this uh, self-publishing thing. Like, like I've been doing for probably the last five, six years. So I was like, Rick, dude, I mean, even <laughs> on the side, I, I, and I've talked to some, just the contacts I have well, with him. Like, deal where you write on the side as a, like, say you, you join thrillers with them. Got it. Okay. Well, I should be free then to go ahead and publish in another genre. Right. Yeah. So I'm not competing against you. Yeah. But Unless you contractually they can't. But if you if you can't, I would want to make sure in my contract that I could put something else out under a, a pseudonym. You know, use yeah. use yeah, a pen name and whatever. yeah, and then yeah, because to me I would I, I I didn't get published till my till it was my fourth book I wrote, and it really shouldn't have been to my fourth book because I didn't know what I was doing well enough for those first three. 
Yeah. But I'd like to revisit those at some point. And I actually have a plan to revisit one of them here in the next couple of years. Um, it, but man, if I had, if I got a book deal, but I still kept writing two, three books a year and I, they were just sitting on a hard drive and I was like, well, you know, they can't get published and that would like frustrate me. But eat that, it too. Yeah. That they're sitting on a, I mean, Many I have a whole, stories. I have a whole folder of old stories up until I actually had sat down and wrote my first novel. I had, Folder after folder with word documents in it of of stories that are were what I thought were good ideas that I started but I never finished. Mm. Yeah, at some point down the line, I probably will start opening opening up, opening up those old files and being like, "There was a nugget to that character. This sucked, or <laughs> I didn't finish it." But I can take that thought process I had back in my late twenties or early thirties, and now I've got the experience that I can go develop it. Yeah. Um, so th those are my hidden nuggets that at some point here, I'm going to start, you know, pilfering from to write the next series or whatever. I've got, uh, so my last year I was working in Germany, uh, I was over there as a, uh, DOD contractor working for a U.S. European command so mm -hmm. I was in Stuttgart. And, um, two of the years that I was there, I was doing a part-time, uh, graduate program at Oxford. So I'd fly there for a week. And wow. then come back and I'd be home for eight weeks and then I go back for a week and I'm home for eight weeks. And mm -hmm. so they were really good about letting me do that uh, because the program I was going for was really actually quite helpful for the command. <laughs> the skills okay. and stuff I was learning, so it was very helpful for them. Um, but I really kind of got turned on to writing a lot more there because mm -hmm. uh, that was in 2012 and 13. Okay. and. I had you had to write a lot. So the the British education system is far different than the American side. So mm -hmm. over there, when you have a module you're studying, you, and you have to take your exam. Your exams are not like uh, multiple choice questions. They're not and little bubble things. <laughs> nothing like it is here in the US. An exam for them is they're going to give you a a question, and you're mm -hmm. going to have to write a three thousand word or five thousand word answer to this question that's yeah. going to be peer reviewed with you know supporting documentation to back mm -hmm. up your hypothesis your claim or what it is you know whether you agree or disagree with x y or z right. and whether it's project management or it's on finance or it's on this legal aspect or whatever the topic was for the module we were we were mm -hmm. learning that's what you have to write on and yeah. to me that i thought was amazing and really good because that you had to prove you understood the concept mm -hmm. you actually know what you were talking about because you had to answer this question and right. you had to find articles to support your answers yep. so you know the scantron things all you're doing for that is just remembering pertinent details to spit it back on a test that doesn't mean you know it <laughs> yeah memorization and memorization yeah. of the the most basic facts yeah both of my kids have been uh, my daughter will start it next year with her with her education and taking debate my son mm. took it a couple of years ago and it's something that's not normally taught anymore in the public school system they're not public yeah. they're not in the public school system um yeah. but those are the type of things that yeah when you get older you need to be able to debate because and i'm not going to dive into all the crazy things going on in this world debate because debating is really important and being able to convincingly express your opinion or your idea. Cause if you work in sales or management or different aspects of the economy like that, you're going to need those skills. Yeah. And that's a skill gap that's not taught in schools at no. all. At no. All. And debates not. And uh, um, I, again, uh, we talked about before political, it doesn't have to be political. It's about an idea. It's about sales, business, whatever it is. Yeah. Right. I'm going to avoid, I said, we're going to avoid politics and we're going to, but I want to say this one thing, maybe not you have, maybe not even you respond to it, it might be best, but I saw this clip today and it just made me think of this. Um, as we're filming this, there's a lot of uh, protests going on in schools, mm -hmm. Columbia in, in New York, especially. Yeah. Um, and this girl, the clip was, you know, it was a minute long clip and that's all I watched, but the girl was standing on the front steps saying that she hopes that the officials there will allow food and water to be brought in because that 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 shouldn't it's a basic human right that shouldn't be and uh, uh you know not allowed to have and so one of the people that was i couldn't see him but you could hear the voice and said but you're staying in this spot by force you you've blocked yourself off and now you're not supposed to be there and you're requesting 
that food and water be allowed. And she said, well, we're not asking them to bring, we're not asking the officials to bring us food and water. But if food and water were like what Uber eats, if we were to get food delivered here, we don't want it to be stopped. And I'm, I'm listening, this is a minute. And I just, I processed it. And then I just thought, what have we taught these kids where they've in a position now where they think, hey, we, we can go break the law because protesting's fine. Yeah. I will give anyone the right to stand up and protest whatever yeah. they think. Yeah. However, you don't have the right to break into a building and basically take the building hostage until your demands are met or whatever. That yeah. then is a violation of the law. So then yeah. to say, but I have basic human rights you can't violate at this point. I'm like, no, this, I'm sorry. This is our education system in a nutshell, yeah. at least at least in well, one. It, I liked how Google CEO um how he handled a similar situation last week, I think it was. So they had 50 employees come and do a sit-in in, I think, I don't know if it's his office area or somewhere in the management area, uh, and they were wanting certain demands or whatever. And he walked out and just says, well, I appreciate your, you know, doing all this stuff and what you're advocating for, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? This is a, this is a job. This is a business. And our business is not, you know, up for negotiation with all these other things. And I'm the CEO, so I'm sorry, but here's your pink slips. And he yeah. laid them all off. I mean, when when did we think we suddenly had the right to to dictate to our employer <laughs> what they I can do? <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to call my boss tomorrow and say, hey, buddy, I know I get, I've get i been there for years. So I've been in a really good relationship with my boss. So this is all hypothetically joke. Um, but I'm going to call and say, you know, I get four weeks vacation. We're going to flip that now. And I think I'm going to get... 48 weeks vacation and I'll work four weeks and I'm not going to do any more work until you give me what I ask. And you're going to give me a pay raise for it too. <laughs> I like, James, I like your style right there, but you know, what's my boss going to say? My boss of course is going to laugh at me and tell me I'm stupid and that you, you, you think whatever you want, but no, I mean, I'll see you Monday. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, we can. <laughs> no, they'll just. I work from home actually, so I'll just, oh, my okay. VPN won't work on on the next morning. I'll get a nice little email that says, "By the way, I don't have access to my email anymore. What happened to my yeah. VPN?" If, oh, if you'd like your final paycheck, send us back our computer. <laughs> you oh. no longer work for this company, but and guess what? <laughs> they have the right to do that. <laughs> I'm an at will employee. If I want to make stupid demands, they can deliver justice essentially is what they're going to do. So, um, but yeah, no, that's just yeah, one of those things that you that. talk about the education and stuff. Oh, man, I, this I is like a weird time to be alive. Weird time really to be How, cause in Britain, they, they, that's how they do all their schoolwork and stuff yeah. like that. So I, I enjoyed that. And then, um, you know, they walk everyone over and you can join the, uh, the Oxford union, which mm -hmm. is a, it's not a union. Like you're thinking it's, uh, it's a debate society, so yeah. to speak. So the Oxford Union is this really older than dirt um, debate organization and platform. It's been around for hundreds of years. And what they do is they invite all kinds of people, of speakers in, mm -hmm. and they will then give a, a speech on specific topics or certain things, or okay. you'll have to defend this and this person will have to like litigate it. And they'll have these really amazing conversations about all kinds of different subjects. And you can sit there and listen to them going back and forth as they mm -hmm. argue these points, but they do it civilly. Mm -hmm. they, there's a, you know, there can be a little bit of, you know, jeering kind of how some of the British parliament stuff works a little, yeah. but generally speaking, it's very well uh, orchestrated. It's right. very right. professional, but it also allows people to, to really have good honest debates and convey the questions mm -hmm. um there was a really good one um i'm trying to think what the guy's name was again he he runs a trigonometry podcast mm -hmm. um he was doing one and they were talking about the whole climate um you know environment stuff and he had this really great debate about how you know about how the west treats environmentalism and then how the global south mm. is being uh having this foisted upon them while they never got to you know they're in the middle of like their industrial revolution so to speak you know they're they're trying to industrialize yeah. trying to move into the next you know the next echelon of 
manufacturing, job growth, different things like that, their societies. But what are we doing? Mm. We're infringing on them and denying them the right to have, you know, cheap energy and abundant energy because we're insisting that it has to be this ultra green, very right, expensive, right. out of their league to afford it and maintain mm -hmm. it. But that's all we'll, we'll give them. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was in Europe, right? So uh, one of the countries I worked in a real lot was in Kosovo. And okay. Kosovo has a has a coal plant, coal power plant there. And they've mm -hmm. got, I think it was four or six turbines. Well, half the turbines don't work because they got damaged during the war. Mm -hmm. And for a decade, they had been unable to get these turbines fixed because the EU and the different groups there would not allow them to get the parts to Love fix the parts, yeah. They were insisting on them basically erecting a slew of these uh, windmills on one of the mm -hmm. uh, one of the range, mountain range areas near the airport. And so they were putting these on there, but it was the cost of the electricity from that was beyond what the majority of the people could afford. Could afford, yeah. And the, the two remaining turbines that were working couldn't generate enough electricity to keep the, the whole country powered all the time. I mean, this is like 2012, 2013. Yeah. And they have rolling blackouts because they don't have that. Mm -hmm. And they're being denied the ability to get the parts necessary for these other turbines right. to then bring the whole country to be electrified. Um, Sounds like California. Like, California has rolling blackouts a lot of years, yeah. and they have the resources, they have yeah. the finances to be able to resolve that, whichever way they want to do it. Um, but here they still have their power go out, you know, however many times a month sometimes. Crazy, so, yeah, it's it's just... Let's talk about something more fun than that. Let's talk about interrogation. So, <laughs> so, so no, and I, and I don't want to get into details. No, no, you're fine, dude. Ask away. There's very few of us that have done this job ever, and very few of us that have done it in a war, and very yeah. few that talk about it. So ask your ask away or whatever. I don't have a list of questions. Just one of the things I want to do is maybe maybe give a synopsis of what an interrogation session would look like, or, or, or you know, because I know that would vary. But also, I think most people have interrogation thought process in their brain from reading mm -hmm. books or watching, of course, television. Yeah. Yeah. What do people probably have wrong about interrogation that they've been fed for years from probably the media? A lot of people look at the interrogation uh, stuff and they think they think of it like what you would see with some of the James Bond stuff or with the Jack Bauer from 24 series. Uh, mm -hmm. They think of it like that. It's very intense. It's very brutal. Lots of this, that, back and forth. It's really not quite like that. Now, there are different styles and kinds of interrogations. Okay, so if you're uh, if you're out in the field with a with a tactical unit on the ground and you're doing a tactical interrogation, what the approach and what you're trying to get is going to be wildly different mm -hmm. than when you get to like a division, you know, internment facility or a theater facility where I was at. So. Those guys, they're looking for immediate stuff for mm -hmm. what's in there, what's happening around them and trying to get intel for the next mission or to just go like, oh, there's a, we've got this ID. We found the guy who did it. You know, mm -hmm. like, OK, look, dude, who gave you this stuff? What, where is it coming from? And he points to some guy. Well, <laughs> they're going to haul ass after him. So right. those are, that's a different style of, uh, of interrogation yeah. and questioning. Uh, then you get to like the 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 larger detainment facility. So regionally, they'll have, they have these things in Iraq in different regions, north, you know, east, west, south, and central. And mm -hmm. so when they capture the guys, they bring them in, they've got 72 hours, 72 to 96 hours typically to make a, a determination. Are we going to retain him and keep him? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to cut him loose? Okay. Um, I, I went and worked at one of those for three weeks. Um, so weird. So I'm at the, I'm in the main facility at Camp Cropper in Baghdad. And some Christian missionaries had gotten kidnapped up in Mosul. So mm -hmm. they requested some uh, interrogation support for us to go up there to go help them find mm -hmm. these people. So my aunt, me and my analyst and one other interrogator, so one analyst, two interrogators are told to get on the plane, next plane out of here. So it's Easter Sunday. We're on a plane. We're, we have to fly to Kuwait to catch the next bird to fly from Kuwait to Mosul. Wow. Uh, long freaking trip to get up there we get up there it's like two in the morning one or two in the morning it's pitch black 
the the C-130, you know, he's rolling on there, rolls the ramp, and we just, you know, hop off with our bags, and they, they take, our, take off and continue on to the next fob. Mm -hmm. And so my guy he comes out from the dark with the, G, or the Humvee or whatever. He's like, hey, you guys so-and-so? We're like, yeah. Like, okay, throw your stuff at the, in, the, in the truck, you know, and then, like, minutes later, you get hit with a bunch of uh, mortars or something because the plane, they heard the plane, so they hit the base. They start and, shooting. <laughs> like, what the hell? You know, welcome to Mosul, right? So, yeah. Um, you know, we finally get checked in to you know a couple of shoes that we're going to stay in, and then the next morning go to the to the detainment facility. It's a chief warrant officer running over there, so I'm like, "All right, chief, we're here. Where's our prisoner? Where's our prisoners? We need to uh, start interrogating. What's all going on?" He looks at us. He's like, "Huh? I guess they didn't get the message." And I was like, "What's that? Oh, no. We just shipped those guys down to you in Baghdad last night." I'm like. Mother Ever, you mean those guys that we jumped off and the guys that got on was our prisoners? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, All right, whatever. I was like, look, Chief, you got us for three weeks. What can we help you with? What oh, do wow. you need? What do you want? Because you've got two really very experienced interrogators here to help yeah. you. What can we do to help you guys out? Mm -hmm. And he loved that because he had uh, uh he had two contract interrogators who were pretty decent. Uh, they were pretty good. And then he had, uh, I think it was like five or six army interrogators who were pretty much like 18, 19, 21. <laughs> and so fresh, brand new out of schoolhouse. Uh, some of them we knew in the schoolhouse because we, a lot of us had come from the schoolhouse too. But mm -hmm. all the Air Force guys were all prior NCOs. They were okay. all NCOs when they went to the schoolhouse. So we already had a you lot had of that experience, information, yeah. college degrees and things like that before we ever went. And then we went mm -hmm. to a lot of the advanced courses afterwards. So it was kind of funny because we, we get there and, um, um, you know, me and my analysts were like, man, let's figure this out. So, you know, you have that short time to say, I'm going to keep them or kick them loose. Well, mm -hmm. as they start bringing people in, man, we are just hammering through this list one after another, lining them up and we're kicking almost all of them out. And they said, they come and say, hey, what's up, man? We normally send a lot of people to Baghdad since you guys showed up. You're cutting loose like three out of four of the people here. I'm like, yeah, because they're worthless. They have no value. There's no intel value to this. You just right. randomly scooped up a bunch of people <laughs> cooperating and telling you much because they don't know anything. They don't know anything. Yeah. And you're sending them to Baghdad. And I'm down there and I'm telling you, we're getting hit with like six to 800 new prisoners a week, not a month, a freaking week. We got 56 interrogators who have to sort through that crap mm -hmm. on top of existing cases we have. And you're not helping Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know but when we did find one you know we had a uh iraqi uh colonel he got arrested and okay. that so he got handed off to me like my second day i was there um he was the brigade s2 so okay. he was an intel guy and uh, idiot okay so i mean he's former regime guy we brought him back in nothing wrong with that but what was wrong is as an intel officer he was doing what Intel guys should do, which is develop sources and networks and do different clandestine things off the fob to infiltrate and get names and information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he was trading information to kind of like mm -hmm. ensure his source doesn't get captured so mm -hmm. his source can continue feeding things. What they don't realize is we're listening to all of that, like everything, emails, text messages, phone calls, there's nothing electronic happening in Iraq we didn't know about. You didn't know about, And man. we were obviously intercepting all this, and that doesn't look good for him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he immediately got arrested, and, you know, we're, like, tying him to like, all the top 10 HVIs in the region. <laughs> like, geez. <laughs> so, I'm like, dude, look, you effed up, obviously. If you're not <laughs> with this, you gotta come clean with me on everything. Uh, and yeah. so, he he did on all that started narking on his commanders and the corruption in the army and all this other stuff. I mean, we were uncovering millions of dollars of corruption and stuff like that going on, all kinds of things. It's it bonkers. But we got like twenty four intel reports out of this guy in the span of like ten days. So what what did he want? Did he want just to not 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 to go to jail, or did he want something else out of it? He or to not go to jail and get convicted for espionage and okay working for the enemy and so his way of showing he wasn't doing that was by literally divulging everything he could humanly possibly divulge and tell okay. which was a lot at his yeah. rank and what and what he was doing and so it was a ton mm. and uh you know we nabbed a, a number four hvi with some of the info he gave us which was a real big win and kind of a cool thing to nail um but dude like 
Yeah, the crazy thing, I was like more intel in like a week, week and a half than the entire unit was doing in like a month. Um, but it comes down to the, how do you ask questions? What's mm -hmm. your approach? If you yeah. go into the booth with this guy and you're going to go in there as an alpha male and just scream, yell and kick about, what are you doing? Like, yeah. do you actually care about the job of finding finding the enemy and putting them in the dirt or capturing them? Or are you mm -hmm. just there for an ego trip? Because I care about capturing and killing the enemy. I don't give a shit about, you know, do I look good? Do I feel good? Do I, am I being this stereotypical interrogator? No, I'm the quiet dude who's going to come in here. I'm going to give you a chance to listen to your story. I'm going to mm -hmm. pry as much information out of you as I can. I'll work your cultural. So, you know, it's a good book, The Arab Mind. I read that, really mm -hmm. liked it. And they talk a lot about the cultural thing. Yeah. So the vast majority of my, my interrogations would be over dinner. So that's why mm -hmm. the first book I wrote was called Dinner with a Terrorist. We rewrote it to call it Interview with a Terrorist. Mm -hmm. it, that's how I do most of them because when we're breaking bread together, you know, with their Islamic uh, culture and, and, and stuff, we can't be adversaries when we're breaking bread together like that. Right. So I bring them in really good food from the chow hall, find out what they want. So the second mm -hmm. interrogation, I'm bringing what they want. And we sit there, we have meal, we have a chai, we smoke a hookah pipe, and we start talking. Mm. And it may take that, that might be a two to four hour or six hour interrogation. Yeah. But that's usually going to be a very good one to start to set the stage with him. So sometimes that's my first interrogation. Uh, mm. Usually, well, the first interrogation, I introduce myself and him. I talk about his charges and situation. I say, mm -hmm. look, I'm going to meet with you tomorrow or this day here. We're going to discuss this, but I want us to discuss this over food so we, we can discuss this as, you know, not as adversaries. Let's yeah. figure out the situation, what happened, how we can help you get out of here or figure out what who who narked on you or something. OK, mm -hmm. so tell me what you like to eat, different things. And then I would show up the next day with that. It's a four or five hour interrogation sometimes. But I've, I've established that rapport. I've got that relationship going. Usually that, that second interrogation, I'm starting to get some intel out of them. Mm -hmm. And then the third interrogation, I've now improved their position in the camp a little bit sometimes by getting moved to a, uh, you know, protective camp. So it's a smaller facility mm -hmm. or get them moved into a nicer camp where they can wear civilian clothes. Um, you know, I'm bringing them food. I'm giving them yeah. packs of cigarettes. You know, I'm helping these guys out. Or maybe I arrange a phone call for them to mm -hmm. talk to their wife. They haven't talked with them three or five or six weeks. Yeah. Um, but I've got that relationship. Now he feels compelled to start sharing some more with me to mm -hmm. keep this gravy train running. Yeah, he absolutely. Knows, I'm done. And that's, and he knows that. Yeah. You know, well, I could see that, that, that philosophy too. working a lot better with someone of a higher rank versus yeah. if you've got someone that's green, that's just in there. First of all, they might not know much. I know that, but you might be able to scare them. You might be able to throw the book at them and have them freak out, but you got a guy at that level. I you scream at him and, you're not going to scare them as much. Yeah, because like when they're coming in, you've got, I mean, I usually would have like 14 to 18, you know, prisoners at a time as mm. the caseload I'm kind of carrying. And I have some prisoners that I've been interrogating and talking to for four or five months. I had one, mm. I had, I had held him for over a year wow. uh, of, of talking with this guy. And sometimes I would go a couple of months without, without interrogating him at all. And, um, and that during and that, that month period, he's just back in his holding cell or wherever, just he's back, in the, he's back in the camp. You know, he's so he's out there in a camp with okay. uh, usually with another twelve hundred fifty other prisoners. Okay, okay. You know, just sweating out there in the heat. But um, you know, in that with that guy, he was uh, he was associated with the Al Qaeda outside of Iraq, and so there was a lot of reasons for us to hold this guy because it was a long term, a long term mm. questioning process and things, and it was tied in with. Uh, probably half a dozen other countries. And so I was working with other intel groups in different AORs to coordinate info mm -hmm. or have them investigate this, like physically go to this city, take photos of these areas, send it back to me. I will go in and question the prisoner on this. I will confirm or deny these things and I'll get you other intel on what you need. Mm -hmm. I need help with X, Y, Z. And okay. there was a lot of sharing going on like that. We tied a really big network together from you know Europe, the Horn of Africa, and into uh, the Middle East, and it was a massive car ring. Like they were buying, they were either taking donated cars from Europe or donations, and then purchasing these um, you know 150000 dollars you know BMWs, Mercedes, expensive mm -hmm. cars. They ship them into Kuwait. They have their couriers pick them up in Kuwait, drive them up into Baghdad, 
and most of the time the cars would be sold the profits from the uh, the whole sale would be profit all of that would then pay the salaries of you know 40 or 100 al-qaeda operatives mm -hmm. for the next couple months or pay for the money for the weapons they need to acquire for the next ops yeah. uh, a lot of times you know we had um iraqi unit uh they had a 666 unit, uh, I think it was a 999 unit that they had, uh, who used to do a lot of like, um, these are like your agency SAD units uh, yeah. that were part of I the Rocky Intelligence Service, the ISS. And so some of those guys were out and about. And if the Al-Qaeda guys pay them enough money, they'll their teams would come back together for op certain mm -hmm. ops. And we were really worried about some of those because they were way better trained and knew what they were yeah. doing. Um, but you know, that's one part of it. The other thing they would do is they would have this 120,000 R BMW. It's really nice looking. And they'll fill that thing up with three or four or 5,000 pounds of explosives. Mm. And so as this thing's coming towards an ECP on the, on one of the bases, you're looking at this thing and like, damn man, look, that's a new 740 IL, you know, and whatever. And it looks nice. It's black, nice. black you know, windows. They put little flags on it. It can look official. Right. And coming up and they are able to get right up into the ECP or inside the, the, the two checkpoint spots before they detonate. Before they detonate, and then, yeah. It kills, you know, a dozen, two dozen people right off the bat like that. And you mm -hmm. don't think about it because who's going to blow up a $120,000 car? Yeah. You don't think about it. So it's an easy way to slip it through and make mistakes. Mm. And wow, we would then obviously take the remnants, look at the uh, what's left over, find all the forensics on that. So you're getting VIN numbers from all the parts. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you get that you put them in a database and then when you do raids you find all the the materials mm -hmm. uh, you scan all that stuff in there and if you can get like shipping manifest look at all the bins on there from the invoice so the manifest that's come in and then compare it against all the the stuff that's going off and see if you mm -hmm. can find a match and when we mm -hmm. do find matches well now we can start linking people together right and you know who who got captured where this invoice was from and then who did they receive it from. And then where's the rest of that chain all the way back to, say, you know, Germany or France or Belgium? And then where does it go from there? And we trace that entire thing back around. There's a lot of stuff that goes involved in doing that. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. It's time consuming. Yeah. And I'm usually interrogating 12 other guys. Well, that's kind of like slow burning on the side. And that, yeah. <laughs> you know? now, so how long um, how long were you doing this for and, and how long were your deployments? Oh, so we were gone 556 days. That was a long freaking time. Straight. Uh, no, not straight. I saw oh, my okay. wife probably 26 of the, 26 days, 28 days out of 500, okay. 556. So I, I didn't see her very much. Yeah. We've been married one year when I got my deployment, when I got my deployed for that. So we had our, our, our big train up period, which is kind of intense and takes a while. And then you go mm -hmm. and deploy, you, um, you know, you end up merging with a bunch of other units. So there was a Navy contingent of interrogators and analysts. Okay. And there was an Army. Um, we actually linked up with an Army, uh, Utah Army National Guard Intel unit hmm. came over as the Army command element. And so they came over and they had some analysts and interrogators. The Air Force, we actually took on the brunt of the Abu Ghraib mission from the Army be because of what happened. Okay. So the Air Force doesn't traditionally do that. They're, the position's a linguist debriefer, so typically you'll be at an embassy doing strategic debriefing mm -hmm. on like people who are defecting or pilots, different things like that. Right. Um, but we got tagged with this mission, so then mm -hmm. we had to come up with you know a lot of bodies to fill in, essentially yeah. an Army yeah. job goes through all the army schools then goes through all the advanced schools because this air force are going to make you you know super educated right mm. um so you go through all the advanced schools and then you deploy with a unit and you know when you get in theater you maybe you're going to be in baghdad at that unit for a while sometimes you get pulled you'll get detailed off to go work for an agency for you know a few cases or a couple of weeks mm -hmm. other times the uh the the uh SF units, you know, CG soda groups will come and say, hey, look, we need uh, we need five interrogators and we need 15 interrogators for, for JSOCs, you know, ops for the next six months or next four months. And wow. they'll come in and the command's like, dude, sounds cool, but I don't want to give up any of my interrogators because I'm already shorthanded and I'm getting yeah. this massive influx all the time. And you're now going to tell me I have to give you 10 people or six people. Mm -hmm. And so they would, you know, come in and interview us and our first... <clears throat> first couple months we're all like yeah 
I'll volunteer for this. I'll go do this. And we all we all sign up and say we want to do the interview process. Go to go work with Jason Arcus. Well, four months later, when we are burnt to shit and we're just mm-hmm. like just we're ghosts almost like we're just so burnt out like 20 hours a day all this crap like that you've seen mm-hmm. god knows horrible things for four or five six months like that then yeah. jace that comes down to interview us and thinking they got this whole long litany group of people who want to do this and we're all like no 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 and because they wouldn't guarantee us our mid tours and yeah. a lot of us had already been gone for six, seven, eight, nine months. Yeah. And they're telling us they weren't going to, we, we may not be able to take our mid tours. And, you know, that's, we still have six more months left on the deployment or nine months left mm-hmm. on the deployment. Right? And you're going to let us go. We're like, and we're already burnt out. And they're telling us to expect to be working more. More. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, you know, I mean, it was kind of crazy. I, I was, I don't, I, I don't, say, I'm not saying that I was really good as a brag or that I was out, out producing some of my other people as a brag. I approached the job differently than some of my fellow interrogators. Mm. And I approached the style and types of questions differently. Mm-hmm. And that different approach, generally speaking, just led to uh, a lot more intel Better, being yeah. collected and, and uh, pl- collected and, and created into reports in some of what they were going after. And it's not indictment on them or to say that I was better than them. I just approached it differently. Um, you, so you, you went through the same schools before you actively started interrogating. So do you attribute it more to just what you learned in the process and how basically just um, adapting? Some of that I think is is there. So the advanced school I think we learned more in, in like the six week advanced course than we learned in the four and a half month like main course. Okay. Because the advanced course, all of our trainers had already had several years downrange in Afghanistan or Iraq. So they okay. were giving us real world scenarios that they yeah. had just experienced a few months ago. Sure. Uh, a lot of them were, were warrant officers or, or, you know, so they've been around doing this for a while. And they're pretty good. It's almost like ta- uh, it's almost like taking a class versus then doing an internship and dealing with yes. the actual much more of an people internship. that actually have done the work. Yeah, I would say oh. theirs was much more of an internship because yeah, the, the scenarios and the questions and the practice interrogations we did were far more realistic mm-hmm. in how these things would actually develop and work. And a okay. lot of it was about teaching you how to adjust your approaches on the fly while you're in the interrogation Mm -hmm. because you have a lot of personalities you have to constantly be adjusting and changing to right um you know this guy may need a father figure the next guy might need a big brother the next guy might need an absolute asshole and this Mm -hmm. guy might need like a fear figure i mean they all may need different approaches and sometimes they'll use three or four approaches in the same sessions as you're applying pressure pulling away pushing back letting off and in directing them this way and that way and it's all in your questioning too. You, know, you learn how to do what they call it like a circle questioning technique where okay. maybe you've got four or five questions or types of questions you ask and you ask them in different sequences and you'll have like one or two money questions laid in between the sequences around there. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of moving around this like that. And that is difficult for them to uh, defeat or counter. Mm-hmm. Because some people are going to have interrogation resistance training. And so you need to know how to spot that right. and then how to counter that. And that's very difficult to do like on the fly while you're yeah. in the midst of these things. Sure. Remembering everything. And then don't forget, periodically, someone's going to throw a few rockets at you while you're in the middle of all this crap. And right. so you alarm or a big thud, and maybe you got knocked off your ass and maybe you did it. So you got that to contend with too. Oh, and... These guys are not exactly taking advantage of the daily showers we offer them no. or the deodorant. And yeah. 5,000 people in a camp does start to smell a little in, bit. In a region that's not known for its cool, lovely daytime weather. So, <laughs> wow. Aren't you glad you're a writer now? Now, if, now if yes. you smell something, you're probably the cause of it because you're in your yes. office writing and you need to yes. go take your shower. You know what? I can I can convey all of that realism, all of that experience yeah. in some of the scenes and the and the stuff we craft. Like, yeah. Yes, that's awesome. 
Fallen Empire series. Maybe it's in like uh, book three in Vengeance or something. But I had this really nasty, intricate way of doing an interrogation. Mm -hmm. And it was a mixture of a lot of like sensory, electronic sensory deprivation type tactics okay. with some other uh, pharmaceuticals that you intertwine with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some different ways to do some of that that uh, it's quite clever and quite brutal yeah uh, i'm not an advocate of t of uh, like torture because to be honest with you oh, they're just going to give me what they think i want to right. stop hurting them stop yeah and that draws a question as to how valid it is mm -hmm. sometimes it is very seldom is it it's only you yeah. can only get away with that one time you right. can't come back to that well if you once you've done that and you burned it um so I'm not a big fan of that. I think the future of interrogations should heavily, heavily look into the use of like pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. uh, different narcotics and drugs like that, because you can give someone a uh, like a twilight drug. Uh, they do that right now when you go to certain surgeries or dentists, different surgical things like that, where they give you a twilight drug. Mm -hmm. You're docile enough to answer to commands, but right. you don't remember anything. You don't remember. Yeah. You know, and that to me would be a more a better way to test to do that in yep. an environment like that because you're not harming them and they're not going to remember most of it. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be docile enough for you to to pry and probe and ask questions and ask questions. Time. Yeah, and they're not going to know your response. They're not going to counter it. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I and I I know only about it from what I've read or talking to other people that have um, been in that field. And so when I've had to write stuff or chose to write stuff mm -hmm. that dives into that very minor, I've always had someone else read through it and be like, okay, this is what my creative mind came up with. And the average reader out there is not going to really know if it's yeah. true or not. But anyone with any actual real world experience will probably just I mock me. On. Whether they do it vocally or in, in in you know a review or whatever, but but so if I can get it like with anything I you know as as you anything I can write that I can get as authentic as possible without giving mm -hmm. away any secrets or whatever, yeah, that's how I want to get it, and I also want to make it entertaining. So then there's definitely times I'll inject something that's probably not occurring. But I want that reader to maybe remember that one thing or something. Um, I, I had a, a scene that I wrote in the last thing where um, in the course of the discussion that's going on, there's a mention to uh, Harry the White Rabbit, which is mm. an old, uh, um, old, old, old cinematic reference, basically. And I had people actually respond back to it. They're like, oh. uh, not Harry, Harvey, excuse me, Harvey the White Rabbit. Said the, say I said the wrong name. Um, uh, I'm being interrogated. And they, and they come back with you. You're like, you actually knew about that. And you're like, yeah, oh, they knew about it. It's old. Yeah. Old Jimmy Stewart thing. So, and, and, and like stuff like that, if I can put stuff like that in and during, even during a pivotal scene, sometimes where, you know, can stand out to people. It's, it's a fun thing. So, um, Basically, but there's also comes a point though, in like some of the realism where, you know, you shouldn't subscribe to try and be over realistic or sometimes there are some things they are real in war. But just because it's real in war and that stuff really happens does not mean you necessarily need to show the public or tell them that right. or explain it in a certain level of detail beyond what, you know, paints the picture. Because mm -hmm. there's some, some guys, I don't know if it's like gorephobic or they just like, they, you know, it's war porn, they just like have some of this a little too much stuff or they yeah. feel, you know, oh, it's not real enough if it doesn't have like a curse word in every other sentence. And it's like... Mm -hmm. Well, that's a sloppy way of writing if that's what you think, because the yeah. fact is you should be able to convey anything and everything you need to without using any curse words. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that you shouldn't have them or they don't have their place. It's to say that it's a it's just being lazy and sloppy if that's the crutch you're going to constantly fall back to, rather than finding a more convincing and compelling way to paint the same picture yeah. without yeah. using the word. Because if you do this from a business perspective, okay, you're going to limit the audience that can that can get your book, right? Okay, that will buy your book or have exposure to it. Yeah. And if the goal is to sell books, then the goal should be to not uh, limit your audience because you chose to put a graphic sex scene in a war book that has no place right. for it, or a whole lot of profanity. 
Yeah, I and I won't say who, but I read a book, and this is several years back now. I, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of the high three hundreds for the f bombs being dropped. Uh, I and stop a book after like halfway if it's just like it that. was. It was it at the point of obnoxious. And yeah. when the person's next book came out, I didn't read it because I was just like, I assume it's going to be the same. And I just, yes, I know in that type type of a role, or a, I know some people in this in the service that swear a lot. I, I get do. that. I I understand. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I understand it's realistic, but I, but, but it becomes too much. I, it doesn't need to be there. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and like, you don't, you don't need to describe some of the nitty gritty of, you know, some of the actions and the fights and how things yeah. get, because it can get, it can get pretty damn personal and, and graphic into some of these sure. things. I'll be honest, I mean, I've seen, I've seen so much of this just, absolutely terrible stuff from the interrogation side because mm -hmm. you have the intel packets i mean like you know what these guys are involved you know, in what they're yeah. doing and i mean they're, they're these are monsters these are actual animals and monsters that mm -hmm. you're having to talk to and you know from you know we had iraqi cops that we've worked with and they got their heads all lopped off because the the al-qaeda guys uh found out who they who was sort who was providing intel to us mm -hmm. so they cut all their heads off and you know we have a video of them doing that with a butter knife and then kicking their heads around like soccer balls. Well, we knew these fucking people, you know, mm. and they do this to that. And that makes you mad. Yeah. And I don't need to draw that into the book. I don't need to write that kind of mm. a thing in there because that's a shock value thing. And what what purpose am I serving by giving them something right. like that? Uh, there's just levels of, of war and combat that don't necessarily need to be explained or shown to the public because honestly they shouldn't have to see it mm -hmm. uh, you know we don't need to tell them everything <laughs> yeah no under, yeah well and sometimes just alluding to something it, it's kind of like with a lot of sex scenes of course yeah. in books where if you allude to it let people's imagination finish the yeah. scene you it's don't need to go into the yours, yeah. it, 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 it will end up yours. Their imagination will create something better than probably your feeble attempt to describe what the woman's feeling or what the guy's yeah. doing. It's yeah, no, yeah. I'm I don't go into anything like that. I have some references to stuff, but it's yeah, tame. Um, yeah. In, in comparison to what some things I've read, sometimes I'm like, geez, yeah, okay, I'll just skip to the end of this. So no interest. Yeah, it's weird because I, I. I don't write, we don't usually have like profanity in our books, profanity or sexual content. That's something my wife is really big on. It drives me mm -hmm. a little nuts because I, I admit, you know, it's uh, it's obviously used in real life. But what I do is I actually do write with a lot of it in there in the first draft of the manuscript. She my takes care of that for goes you. Around and she eliminates it all. Because I've <laughs> said to her, I said, look, I'm going to write it as it flows in my head, the way I yeah. think it, and the way I've seen it done and how it works. If you can, however, rephrase some of that to still incorporate the exact the same meanings and way to do it, right? I'm all for it. But in the moment, I'm not seeing how to do that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm nine years into this and thirty some odd books. I've I've picked up how to do that and get better at that myself. Get better at but it, yeah. Early on, that's kind of what I would do, and my wife would work with that, and we kind of figured some of that. Now it's just become a little bit more of like a almost like a brand thing in a way because mm -hmm. people. Know up a Rizone Watson book and their 13 year old can read it even yep. if it can be war subject they right. know they're not going to come across a lot of inappropriate things like you know heavy use of profanity or sexual content type materials mm -hmm. I used to be you know 14 and wanting to read some of these books when I was yeah. younger and it was very challenging because a lot of these things had a lot of that kind of material in it right my parents wouldn't let me you know, so I, I remember that. So I want to make sure that kid has that chance. Has that chance. Well, let's pivot to because because talking about that and, and limiting something to get your book to a wider audience. Um, mm -hmm. One thing you've done successfully, which is not done a lot with indie publishers or, you know, self-publishing is you've been able to really crack and I know it's a lot of work so it's not like there's a secret formula that's you learned in 5 minutes but you've been able to crack into the marketing side of it. So yeah. you know what are some tips to people out there that are trying that are slogging up that mountain? What are some yeah. what are some tips that at least can point people the right direction on the marketing side of running your own business? The first thing you got to you got to look at is oh. are you are you writing for a hobby or are you writing because you want to be a legitimate, serious writer that's going to live off of your 
writing. Mm -hmm. And if you're a hobbyist, it doesn't really matter so much what you're writing. You, know, you can write whatever you want because the goal in that perspective is not necessarily to make money to pay the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Now, if the goal is the other side and you want to pay the mortgage and, and support your, your kids, you have to think strategically on what it is you're going to write. Mm. Okay. Because you have finite time in the day and every month mm. to create a book or a yeah. series. So one, I'll tell you, do not write single books because singular singular books are very difficult to make a living on mm -hmm. because it's a one sale and it's done. Yeah. And that means you have to have a lot of those one sales and dones. You're going to need to have a book that is uh, typically in a series. Now, that doesn't mean each book has to like continue on into the next, into like the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's plenty of people like, like Lee Child where he has, you know, 30 odd books or whatever it is. And each book's its own scenario. Now, mm -hmm. you can do that. We have the same characters and they're different scenarios. That's fine. But the point is, it's a series that continues on out. It's not like a singleton, 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 you right. know, unstructured like that. Um, so that's the first part. The next one is you have to look at it and say, all right, what, what I'm thinking of writing, is this already being done in the market right now? Mm -hmm. If so, is it saturated? Mm -hmm. Is it selling? Are there gaps? Because if there are gaps in the market and the stuff around it that's close but not quite it mm -hmm. is selling really well, there's a high likelihood when you pop some stuff out that fits between there that that's filling that hole, mm -hmm. it's going to take off. And that's what we've done with ours. You know, so an example I can give you is when when I was doing uh, the Red Storm series, right? So I was looking at 2017 and saying from 2017 to, to 2030, what's going to be the most likely conflicts? And I mapped out and said, okay, well, it's going to be Ukraine, Korea, Taiwan, and Pacific, and it'll be Russia and China as the as the adversaries inside there. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, all right, what is a series that I can construct that'll encompass this whole thing and develop it out? And so we decided to do that. Going and doing that was brilliant and perfect because it covered a whole range of conflicts. Mm -hmm. It's also not something that will age out per se, because that series finished in December of 2018. So that finished five and a half years ago, a long time ago. That series still makes just just shy of six figures, uh, you know, a year, five years after it's been completed. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really important as a full time writer, because you have to develop a backlist. That's yep. going to continue to churn money for years and years afterwards, right. because it's very rare that one series is going to be lightning in a bottle and hit hit half a million to a million dollars every year. Right. That very rare. Uh, it does happen. Uh, I've got um, three of my series are approaching a million each, but they're not. But they didn't do that in one year. They may have spread that out over three years or something. Mm -hmm. But you you want to have a couple of successful series in the backlist that are earning you know 50 to 100,000 and when you got three book series that are doing that it's a little less pressure on the current ones mm -hmm. to have them perform really well right. but that requires forethought into what you're going to write right now and will the series still have value 5 years into the future mm -hmm. you know and so every series needs to be like that so we did the red storm one the next one we looked at was our Fallen Empires one, where we looked at and said, okay, social media is being used to divide and conquer. And I looked at it and said, given all the training experience I had and the stuff I saw and did and, and was working on and doing with in Europe, uh, and some of the stuff in the Caucasus, Middle East, I mean, a whole lot of backstory of what was going on in like the Balkans and in Ukraine that, you know, I was there for all that coup and that Maidan stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff I knew about that. Um yeah. You know, we were there for the Qaddafi stuff, too, and the Syria thing. You just I got a lot of knowledge on that whole background, what happened behind the mm -hmm. scenes, because we were very, very much involved in that crap. The, I looked at that and I said, if I was using that experience and training, I was going to aim it at, my, at the U.S. as an adversary. How would I do this? So mm -hmm. Red sells it out. How would I F with the entire elections? How would mm -hmm. I do this and go for that? Or an entire series on that. I had no idea it would be actually pretty scarily followed later on a couple of years later um 
Who but, was reading your books? I tell you. Yeah, I actually had. Some, we're not. I'm not lying. I actually had several state legislatures from a couple of different states actually reach out about that book because they wanted to know: Is this a fictional tale of of stuff, or is this like legit? Can actually happen? Yeah. And I walked in through and said, no, this can happen. And here's how I would F up your election and do this. It went through a litany of things. Wow. And kind of we're like, wow, I did not think that's possible. I said, that's yeah. because you're not thinking the way an adversary is going to think. Right. So, you know, that was one. Because I put that as a cautionary tale is here's how here's how this stuff's going to happen and be used against us and, and let it play out. Um, and then the next series, uh, that was an intense series. I needed a short break from the thriller stuff because we got really hammered on social media with right, left. They just didn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's when I took a break and started writing some of sci-fi and okay. took the thriller mindset to sci-fi, which they hadn't seen and done. So it was so diametrically different mm -hmm. that that series just shot off like lightning out of a bottle because it just hadn't been done in that genre before. Mm -hmm. The style and approach we've taken. And right. so it filled the need of vacancy and there was no other books or series like it that were doing so it yeah that series has continued to do well and maintained like of the top 100 in a couple of the different genre categories there's anywhere from five to all 10 of the books ranging in that that category all the time all Even the time on the thriller, yeah. we have anywhere from three to ten books on the top 100 like the military thriller and techno thriller genres there. And mm -hmm. we'll have that on the sci-fi. Now, real quick, are you doing Kindle Unlimited with them as well? Or do you? Do. You do, yeah. okay. Yeah, you have to, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Now, you know, for marketing-wise, I, I have a pretty good uh, strategy with the marketing to help counter some of that. So a, a good chunk of the audiences that I target and go after are traditionally published um, authors because gotcha. their right their readers are used to paying fourteen ninety nine for an ebook. Yeah, they're used to buying the book and not downloading it. Mm -hmm. So when they see book one of one of my series, and it has seven six thousand or seven thousand reviews on it, it's mm -hmm. five ninety nine, not fourteen ninety nine. And then book two and the rest of them are nine ninety nine. That's still cheaper than their mainstay. Right, hundred percent. Honestly, I think our stories are as good or better than a lot of theirs because I'm not constrained in the formulaic box that a lot of trad pub um, editors will keep you in. Yep, you know, it's a three stage act and it's very consistent, very formulaic, very easy to see. Mm. Um, ours are nothing like that. Because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have that restraint against me, and yeah. I can also take the time to to develop a very complex story with a lot of different angles to it across a couple years. You know, with like eight books, like the Monroe Doctrine, mm -hmm. highly complex of uh, story and theme of what's happening across those eight books. Mm -hmm. A lot of technology, a lot of espionage stuff, a lot of gritty combat action, and it took a little bit of time to develop. But what we have in there is wildly scary advancements in technology and how this will work on the battlefield. You mm. know, in 2020, we were talking about autonomous killer drones, like these FPV drones in, in Ukraine. I've already been writing about those things for since 2017 and how that's right. going to change the battlefield and be used for that kind of attack or surveillance yeah. or ISR for tracking. Um, and putting that in there, we were talking about in integrating in like the uh, the Ripsaw M5, you know, from, from uh, uh, Textron, I think it is. Uh, that is a beast of a machine. It is a it is a um, semi-autonomous, remote-controlled ground tank, essentially. Mm -hmm. it's a smaller vehicles, so I think it's like maybe 2,000 to, 2, to 4,000 pounds, but they can fit. You know, you can fit a pair of javelins on that thing, a pair of star streaks on that thing, mm -hmm. and still have a a 30 millimeter chain gun on there well that's a hell of a little scout vehicle yeah. that can maneuver as a like a wingman buddy for an armored unit yep. to go up there in front of the elements it's very low to the ground and small it's got great optics so you can go in there find the enemy and then start lasing targets for either your javelins to go after them or air support artillery mm -hmm. Or you just wait and just continue to wait until the rest of the tanks, you know, get online and start engaging targets. But yeah. that's where the future of warfare is going, is right. that. And then in these surrogates or augmented humanoid drones, mm -hmm. that's the next iteration you'll see is uh, like uh, uh, 
uh, was it Tesla has their Optimus, you know, yeah. uh, drone, right? It's a worker drone. There's a couple of them that have that stuff. Mm. I'm telling you, that is going to be the future of warfare right there because you're yeah, going right. to have a drone, pull it kitted out with this combat gear, magazines, you'll be able to change it out and load just like a normal human will. Mm-hmm. Now, the question is going to be, is there going to be an operator, you know, like we have in Creech Air Force Base, is there going to be some operators using that as a surrogate mm-hmm. and, you know, man in the machine, so to speak, using that? Or is this going to come to a, a, a an autonomous, an AI yeah, autonomous AI. level where we can just geofence it and say, okay, you are allowed to operate in this geofence. Here's right. your rules of engagement. Here's what you can do and can't do. Mm-hmm. And then you put it in there and you, you know, monitor it and you go to the next one. You just, you, you chain them all together like that. You could do something like that. And yeah. that's where warfare is going to go. And the question is, are we think, do we have military leaders and develop and, and like researchers and, and think tanks talking about that, exploring how we're going to react to it and counter that? Or is it really just a handful of us writers thinking about these things and putting out stories about Kid about this this in the future. So you can't answer this, but I I, I want to really know: Are you taking these uh, these royalties and everything, and are you buying a South Pacific island to just get away from all the ongoing w- what's coming down the chute at some point? <laughs> I wish, I wish. I, <laughs> I don't. You know, we we've done really great with sales and, and stuff like that. But the thing is, you know, this is a tough business, and it is. You know, it, and you treat it like a business, which is you have to, you yeah. have to 100%. Yeah. A friend of mine um, writes under um, AG Riddle, writes on the pen name that AG Riddle. So he was telling me, he's like, look, man, you got to ask yourself, do you want to write five books a year for an audience of 10,000 to earn a decent living? Or do you want to write one or two really good books to an audience of 200,000? I was like, well, I would rather do that because I can put more emphasis and create a better story. Right. I'm a little stressed doing that. Yep. He's like, all right, so if that's your target, then you've got basically the next three to five years to figure out how you're going to get that audience. Mm-hmm. So you got to have first the story, good quality, all that's got to be there. But now, as the money starts coming in, you have to be willing to take huge risk. Mm-hmm. spend way more than people would like to spend yeah. to find and acquire that audience. And sometimes that means spending 10 or 30,000 a month in marketing sometimes. Right. And that's right. scary to do. Um, but if you're going to grow the business, you have to do that and invest mm-hmm. in growing your readership because otherwise you're going to be, it's, it's like a prisoner's dilemma. I've got 10,000 rabid fans that'll read anything I write, but the problem is there's only 10,000 of them. And I got to create a book every, you know, three months to feed it and then get a, enough of a tranche of money to support myself for a little while. Right. But I'm stuck in a rat race like that, going constantly racing and you're not really getting ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't really want to do that. So I kind of uh, done some different business sides of things where um, mm-hmm. get form yourself as an S corporation or LLC. OK, you need to be an entity. So mm-hmm. you, can call, you can get an EIN for your as a business. Yep. Once you have an EIN, you work with SBA or your local credit unions or something to establish corporate credit, like a business credit, mm-hmm. whether it's a business credit card, uh, lines of credit, things like that. You know, we did that with a credit card. Then we got a uh, a line of credit. So when the um, COVID hit, that was a, a boon for our small businesses if you knew mm-hmm. what you were doing. So we got like the EIDL loan, you know, which was um, – huge sums of money you could get for uh just a signature from your business and mm-hmm. then 30 years to pay it back at 3.75 percent interest no bank in the right mind is going to give you that ever but the treasury department did right. so hell yeah i grabbed that mm-hmm. and then took part of it and called a bunch of banks and said hey if i give you 75 grand in cash as collateral will you give me a hundred and fifty thousand dollar line of credit because mm-hmm. i wanted to establish credit for the business you know, like, you know, a bunch of them say no. One of them finally says, well, we won't give you 150, but we'll give you 100. Will that work? So like, okay, yeah. So did that, made great payments with that for three and a half years, mm-hmm. leveraged that into another one, which another larger thing with Chase. Mm-hmm. And why you want to have that as a business is uh, when an opportunity comes along the way for marketing, 
you need to be able to have the resources right. to invest in a 90 or 120 day campaign where you're going to drop 50,000 or $60,000 on, on ads across mm. four months or maybe it's six months. Right. But you need to have that, that access available. So that's why you have the lines of credit. And then as the returns come in from your investment on that, you pay it back. So mm -hmm. it's paid down and now you can draw on it again if you need it. Mm -hmm. And you kind of build your thing up. And this is how you build a business. It's yeah. It's like a lot of other businesses. It's just your product is a book and storytelling. Yeah. You you are you are creating your product personally versus acquiring a good and reselling it or whatever. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. It's challenging. And you know. Do you want to just be U.S. focused? So for me, I've always been looking international. I use mm -hmm. a lot of Facebook ads to help with doing that international. And uh, typically about 28 to 34 percent of our annual sales comes from overseas. Okay. And so my target goal is actually to get that to a point where 40 percent of our sales, our annual sales are overseas. Okay. So right now, I've got 16 percent of my uh, sales are from Germany are in Germany right now, and mm -hmm. we're massively expanding that because we have uh, 14 titles coming out in Germany this year, and I think it's 16 or 17 audiobooks. So wow. that'll be a big expansion for us. There's a lot mm -hmm. of investment to make that happen, mm -hmm. and then um, you know, trying to you're just trying to grow up because again, as a business, I don't want to be reliant on say the U.S. market and economy doing well because what if it doesn't? Yes. Yeah. Germany is strong and the UK is strong and Australia is strong. It can get me through a bad time in the US right. or vice versa. Or if they're all going good, I'm really doing well. Yeah. And that's kind of how you have to work it. Yeah. I've just, and they're, you know, a four year old, a, a uh, soon to be nine year old and an 11 year old too. And, uh, student still have student loans. Yeah. So you still got those. And then, um, as a small business owner like that, you don't qualify for healthcare plans and stuff. So you have to spend a lot of money yeah. on either self-insurance self right. or other catastrophic plans or other plans that are kind of garbagey. And so there's a lot of little costs like that. And mm -hmm. you're a business owner, so you have to pay the 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 FICA Medicare tax. Right. Your double it. double taxation double essentially. On that one. Yeah. Yeah. So you got all those little nuances and things like that. It 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 really does actually add up quite a bit. Yeah. So you you can understand very quickly how your operating expenses start reaching, you know, start reaching pretty high, mm -hmm. you know, factor all that in and a salary. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, yeah. I'm, so you, you taught me stuff offline about some of that. And then also I've just dived and I'm doing ads mainly in the U S now, but I've started to branch out into UK and Australia and yeah. just in the last month, I'm really dipping my toes in that and seeing what works, what doesn't. It's not mm -hmm. spending much, but at least am I getting a return on it to figure out how it's working? Okay. So it's it's yeah. fascinating. It's interesting. I, I wish I had more time in the day to you know do it and then also try yeah. and write. <laughs> That's funny. So, but because I have a nine to five, and when I have my kids, I don't do much of anything. I do a little bit when they go to bed. Um, but it, it's interesting balance to find. And you gotta really like disciplining your time is what it comes down yeah. to. Because um, oh, sorry, I just got these glasses it's not that long ago. It's for like seeing farther away or, than I wear, and I can't <laughs> see up close sometimes. Whatever, <laughs> getting old, right? Yeah, right? Um, so you have twenty four hours in a day. I, I think one of the things that really helped me with taking back control of a fair bit of my time was when we were in Germany, we didn't have cable TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were in 2010, 2010, 11, 12, th and 13, and we left in early 14. Yes. So yeah. we didn't have TV that we were watching every day. We didn't have programs that we were you know, plugged into and watching in the evenings or on the weekends, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, we might binge a movie here and there. Or, or series here and there, but generally speaking, we didn't have that. So when we came back to the states, we didn't have that as a like a habit. Distraction, yeah, yeah, and we didn't have. We never really, we didn't really pick that back up when we came home because we had been gone from that for so long. It wasn't like a draw for one. Mm -hmm. We didn't need the extra expense, and we didn't have a desire for it. And there wasn't really anything right. on it. We really felt we wanted to see. Wanted to, yeah, wanted, yeah. And so we just stayed away, and that has honestly been a blessing in disguise because. Mm -hmm. You are you'd be really shocked how much time ends up getting wasted on frivolous things like that, mm -hmm. you know. And so that and 
this yeah. little thing right here can yeah. suck away a writing night really quickly. Yeah. So if you're going to spend time on some of these yeah. things, not saying you shouldn't, but what you should do, though, is if you write military thrillers, okay, you should spend some time reading some of the military thrillers of your different mm -hmm. peers, okay? Yeah. Because, one, you're, you're going to learn different writing styles, different techniques. You're going to see kind of what's working, what's not. And it helps you become a better writer mm -hmm. as you see things, either errors or really good things. It may, it's going to make you better. Right. Um, so that's part of studying your craft. And particularly, you want to find the ones who are really killing it because you want to understand why. Yeah. What are they what doing right? It? Yeah. Because a book that's absolutely crushing it is either crushing it because it's really well done and it's just taken off like that, mm. or it has a lot of marketing dollars behind it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know but i want to understand some of those things so you you mm -hmm. find that um read a garbage book and understand why it's bad mm -hmm. understand what are the mistakes that have, that have led this way and are you making any of those right Do you see those in yourself because that's also informative to help you know too mm -hmm. um, so that podcasts are really great to listen to when mm -hmm. you're going for walks or working out or driving in the car audiobooks is the next way to look at it yeah, um, but I also would not spend. A, a, if I read three books in a month, I, one's going to be a fictional one in my realm, or one of the realms I'm writing, sci-fi or thriller. Mm -hmm. The other two are usually going to be nonfiction. Yeah, uh, usually one is some, usually a book on like Elon Musk or some other industrial titan, so to speak, and mm -hmm. then a, another one might be on some other. Uh, you know, I like studying the U.S. presidents, and so I like listening to books mm -hmm. on, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and some of the other different presidents and characters yeah. and, and learn about them and that. Mm -hmm. So I'll listen to some of those. But if I'm listening to three books, that would be the, the style I, or the method I would do is, is in something like that. Yeah. Um, because you, I want to learn and understand how Elon Musk is able to manage and leverage all of these different businesses and technologies and things that he's in, mm -hmm. why is he able to do this and Boeing's not? Why is Lockheed Martin not able to compete with him in certain areas? Mm -hmm. Why is General Motors, which has deep pockets and stuff, why are they not able to replicate Tesla's success with all yeah. this other stuff? Why is the Volt not done what, the, what Tesla did? Yeah. No, hundred percent. You guys have all the knowledge and capability, but the question is, why? What is he doing? They're not. Why are they not able to adapt? Right. Um, all this stuff. It's it's just it's amazing to learn. I want to understand that because mm. there's nuggets from all of that that I can apply mm. to my own business. And yeah. Get better, you know. Yep. No, I was, uh, completely agree, and I'm I'm the same way. I've I don't read as much in my genre that I write in as I did I had, and I haven't for a while. I do, but not, you know, like you said, I've got four on my bookshelf right now next to my bed. One is dealing with the Secret Service. One is dealing with um, the fun period of life we just went through for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> and that's the nicest way to put it, but it's fascinating to read it and be like, oh my goodness, that's what they were doing. Okay, interesting. And it's pretty well documented. Um, and then I'm in a fortunate position where people will reach out to me, um, that want me to take a look at something that I've read some of their earlier stuff or whatever. And so I typically have one of those on normally on my tablet, cause they'll send me a PDF or an ebook of what they're getting ready mm -hmm. to publish at the end of the year. So I've normally got one of those going and then I'm just, and every night I'm jostling. Sometimes I'll pick up two of them, read a chapter of each and then mm. honk off. And but one thing I don't do, uh, and I don't know if you do this as well is, so I've have um, I've made the mistake of writing in two different genres. Okay, um, okay, it's very hard to do, especially when you decide to do them at the same time. Don't yeah. ever do that. That's just like torture. I just finished three and a half years of purgatory doing that. <laughs> three and a half years, um, but when I'm writing sci-fi, I don't read sci-fi. Don't read sci-fi. I gotcha. Because I I don't want to see things in carry it over into mine possibly right. or something like that but i also don't want to be comparing myself to anyone else and what they're doing or not doing yeah so i don't read sci-fi when i'm writing sci-fi and when i'm same when i'm doing throws when i'm writing the military throws i don't touch any other 
things like that. I, I wait till I'm on opposite schedules. Yep. No, I, I do something similar. I, I was going to say one, my funny anecdote to that was years ago, I started writing 2014 and I was very religious every year when Daniel Silva's next book came out, huh. I would yeah. get it and I would read it and I would, I would read it in a couple days very yeah. quickly. Yeah. It just, I, I, and I still to this day think he's probably the purest writer of the generation. Yeah. People can disagree, but just the man knows how to put stuff together. Then I started writing books. And I remember the first year that I was writing, I got his newest book, started reading it. I didn't want to write because I was like, I can't write this well. So for a period of time, I had to put Daniel away and not read his newest releases because it made it. me feel inadequate. For yeah. what I was for the type of espionage kind of thriller stuff I was trying to write. So that's another thing that sometimes you got to be careful that you your favorites might, might spoil you and go, man, I can't do it that good. Or, man, I got a lot to learn. So it's been an interesting learning process for sure. That's that's yeah, definitely. And it's when you kind of get in the, indie, the, the writing community, it's generally speaking a pretty um, interactive group. You know, yeah, there's a 100. lot of people who are willing to talk and help if you kind of reach out uh, yep. sometimes you just have to be willing to uh, reach out like right. ask someone you know you know they're like well i don't know if he is this person would respond or do this or that i'm like well that did you reach out try i mean yep. i can't tell you how many times if people send us a message on you know facebook or you know, a different twitter whatever it's mm -hmm. a message we respond almost within hours sometimes mm -hmm. you know sometimes i'll if i'm at my computer i'm working i see it i'll respond sometimes in minutes yeah um but very rarely does a response go beyond a day mm -hmm. uh, for most people most things like that because you know that's part of the business is yeah no you you did that with me you you've yeah. you responded to me um a couple years back and you know that's mm -hmm. that's the the neat part of this business is the people you get to meet, the yeah. the knowledge base that they're willing to share. And then you then get, I have the opportunity now to then share it with someone else. I've Just since I've gone down the indie route, yeah. I had to figure out, okay, who am I going to use for an editor? Who am I going to use for cover? Because yeah. I'm, and we've had this conversation offline, I'm, I'm firm that you stay in your lane. If your thing to do good is right, well, then you write. But if you're not very good with graphic design, don't waste That's your time right. or waste the effort. Hire a professional. It'd be well worth the money. It, you know, and you have to be able to afford it. I get that. Um, but so I've been able to kind of get a Rolodex of these other professionals that I need as a publisher to be able to put put out a good book. Well, people have come to me and said, man, who are you using for a book cover? Who are you using for editor? I don't yeah. go, man, I can't share that with you. Uh, you'd have my, no, no, I want the guy that does my book covers. I want him to make more money. I want him I, to have I, more opportunities. My thriller cover guy has actually like gotten to a point where he's kind of like asked me to stop sending him clients because he's a. Uh, I keep I keep I've been badgering this guy for five years. I'm like, dude, where is your freaking website so I can just point people to it instead of introducing you via email? And he hasn't really done that and put it together. But he's done all of our thrillers and he does a few other writers. But he I know gets, he's my guy too, and you gave him to me, and I've given him to other people. He's awesome. You know, he, he's in Serbia. He's an awesome guy. He lives in Belgrade, and I've been to Belgrade a handful of times, and you know, mm. so I know some of the different areas there. And you know, he's great. And I swear, I give him like just a few sentences of what I'm thinking. Yep. And he comes back, and I'm like, "How in the hell did you come back with this masterpiece off of this scant little uh, you know, I thing I gave you?" This is awesome. And I mean, wow, every yeah. time he does this with me, I, I just am blown away with it every time. Yep. Um, he gave know, me two and, covers or I got, I, you know, paid for yeah, him, I got two covers it. from him in, yeah. in January and probably I, I've got to get final hardcover and paperback versions in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll ping him back. And then probably in June, I need to get him and uh, or June or July, I need to give the idea of what will come out at the end of the year, my, my end of the year release. And I don't really know yet what I'm doing. I'm kind of going through that now. Um, but yeah, I agree. I'll give him the synopsis. And that one, The Body Man and um, Breach of Trust, I knew what I wanted. Like I was pretty understanding. And, and he, you know, they're behind me. He nailed yeah. exactly what I wanted and did it better than I could have thought. Yeah. The end of the year release, I have zero ideas in my head. So I think I'm just going to tell him what it's about. 
and I'm going to mm. see what he comes up with. And I'm going to tell him, I, you know, I want to, di it's a different story. So a different um, series, it's a new series. So I want it different from the body man um, series. And I'm excited to see what he'll, what he'll come up with. So what he'll come up with. Yeah. yeah. It's really amazing. I'm uh well, hey, before we wrap up, well, as our wrap up question, this is what I ask everyone, a variation of this. Uh, you might have to put your thinking cap on or think about what you, you know, you have a, you have a couple seconds to come up with it. But um, what I've asked everybody so far as guests is I think we can all agree that life is like a book. You know, we all have a first page and we all have a last page and um, none of us know how many pages are in between. But James, you are a writer. If you have the ability to write that last page of your book what would you want that last page to say man that is that's tricky that's tricky that's it can be complicated yes or it could be simple <laughs> it's all <laughs> there's I no wrong would, answer either <laughs> i think i would probably try to write some sort of a of, of note of, of general encouragement for uh, towards my wife and my kids um i would probably try to do something like that uh that write it in a way that it's going to be uh, helpful for a very long time hmm. um you know that's probably how i would approach a final thing like that like uh was it three years ago i think it was three years ago the va uh did a, a scan and they thought that I had a growth on my pancreas. They thought it was pancreatic cancer. Oh, wow. And for three weeks, that's what the assessment was. And so mm. they're doing all kinds of extra stuff at that point to, to verify it. Uh, and they found an old x-ray from five years prior where they saw that same thing there. It was just an off growth of it. And it wasn't, right. a, they determined it wasn't cancers. It was so weeks, I thought I was dead. I, yeah. I was, I figured I've got you know six to nine months. Yeah, pancreatic cancer is not one that you mess with very much. So, so I started yeah. thinking, wow, what am I going to do? So I was like, oh, well, I want to write a whole litany of different types of letters and things to each of the kids. Mm -hmm. And I, I got one of my other writer friends who who would finish both. Who wanted, they, each of them would finish the series that we were working on. You know, right. Wrote up, they would finish it, and it would be done right and well. And it would make it would make a good amount of revenue to help the family and keep yep. that going well, i started then playing all this crap to try to help keep this stuff moving for them you mm -hmm. know and, and found it it wasn't that was like a big mm -hmm. leap uh, yeah it's a good exercise couple, but then the third week i kind of get to the point where I'm like I, you almost just start to accept it yeah. a little bit right <laughs> you, know? you start okay well this is happening so mm -hmm. let's think out what i need to do to prepare for some of this stuff right and and how am i going to what am i going to try to you know what are we going to do to enjoy the time we have you know mm -hmm. but, yeah that's i heard it years ago um and i do not now remember where or who said it um but it, it whatever it was that spurned me to do this and it was not my idea but um but i took that idea someone else had planted in in where i read it or saw it on the internet is um for when my kids turned 12, um, I wrote them each a letter um, from 12 to 18, a separate letter, sealed them. And the start of the letter basically like is, I plan on being here, but if I'm not here, and they're mm. supposed to read those letters on each of those birthdays. They're dated, they're in the safe. And the deal I made with the kids was, I plan on living forever because I'm going to be the one that breaks the curse, you know? I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to take a dirt bath ever. Um, so as long as I'm here, I'll open the letter and I'll read it to you. And that's that, that'll be when we do it on their birthdays on their, on each one's birthday, mm -hmm. we read the letter that's and cool. then I put it back in the safe and I say, if something were to happen to me there, and once you turn 18, they're all the letters are yours. Um, but until then they stay in the safe there with me. And if something happens to me, then, then it's your job to read them. So, um, and I just basically each letter deals with a certain topic like several years ago when my son was in the adolescent age he's 17 now so last last letter um dealt with being 17 and stuff that's happening but a couple years ago it was about girls so i just had a letter that 
the what do I want to share with him about the female race? Um, yeah. And I'm probably not a great person based on my track record to have an opinion, but I have one. So, um, but it's just stuff like that. And my daughters were a harder one because it's like, what do you tell your daughter if you're not there? And what do you tell her about guys? And what do you tell her about finances and relationships or, you know, how to be a good mom or how to be a good human being? So um, it was a great thing to go through. Um, and I don't know, it's one of those things that it's like, man, I, I, you don't know, this could be our final conversation. This could be it for one of us. Hopefully yeah. not, but anything's possible. Well, what are you yeah. leaving behind? And that's how I'm, sh- I mean, I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure you view it as, as well, but these books that I get to write, it's something I get to leave behind. Yes. Uh, I've loved that. yes. that, that, is, yeah. and I, I've said this in a lot of interviews so far that to me, people want to talk about power or this and that. To me, that legacy that you leave behind, that's a powerful thing because it's not just, you know, I'm not giving them a, a, a an equipment that I go, hey, here's here's what I'm leaving behind for you. It's uh, something that's not going to last long. No, yeah. as long as the books are still readable or the digital technology isn't erased by, you know, <laughs> by an EMP, it's something that will exist a, long, a lot longer than I will. Um, yeah. That's a cool thing. I like it, yeah. It, it's a cool legacy thing. And it's all about leaving something behind for the next generations like that, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So speaking of the next generations and the current generation, people that want to go out and they want to get a copy of the books or they want to know more about you, where should they go? Um, you can find our stuff on Amazon, honestly. So if you go on Amazon, you can look it up. Uh, and if you like the thrillers, start with the Monroe Doctrines, our best works i think and if you like sci-fi go with into the stars that's the sci-fi side so that's what i would uh so i go from awesome. there it's easy to find us on email and stuff um all our, our contact info is in all the books and stuff like that okay. so yeah. well, james thanks for coming on so. i appreciate our conversation and uh look forward to all the things you'll be doing here in the coming years yep thank you it's great talking to you guys talk to you later